Welcome to Deep Dive Defense, military and aerospace enthusiasts. Over here we give rare insights you won't hear elsewhere. Today's topic is the Koromshar Liquid Propellant Medium Range Ballistic Missile, the heavyweight in the IRGC Aerospace Force Arsenal. This video is the first part of a two-video series, starting with the history of the Koromshar family up to the Koromshar II variant. The Koromshar has the destructive power of three Ghadar, Sejil or Imad missiles, which were its predecessors. Therefore, its role is to target large or hardened objects that would otherwise require multiple Ghadar or Imad missiles to be launched in a salvo to destroy. Transitioning from the R-17 Elbrus design, commonly called Scud, to a completely new platform was a challenging decision for Iran. They chose the most sophisticated and powerful liquid propellant ballistic missile ever created in the medium range category as the basis for this development. The Soviet R-27 submarine launched ballistic missile, which entered service in 1968, was far ahead of its time. The design bureau behind it, Makayev, later went on to create some of the most sophisticated and potent liquid propellant intercontinental ballistic missiles in the world. The R-27 was a product of intense competition between the United States and the Soviet Union. When the US switched to solid propellant missiles for their SLBMs, creating the revolutionary Polaris, Mikhaev was tasked with developing an equivalent, if not superior, missile. The efforts to create the R-27 were monumental, incorporating numerous innovations. Following the Soviet Union's collapse in 1991, Iran and the People's Republic of Korea were already closely cooperating on SCUD technology-based missile projects. At that time, the R-27, exclusively a nuclear-armed missile, was still in operational service. It is unclear which of the two countries obtained a sample of the R-27, when, or how. In the 2000s, U.S. intelligence first reported evidence of a missile program similar to the R-27 in the People's Republic of Korea. Before attempting to copy the R-27, the Koreans incorporated some of its innovations into their Scud variants, such as common tank bulkheads and divided tanks, to solve center of gravity issues in modified missiles. The advanced and difficult-to-master technologies of the R-27 meant it took about 20 years for the first prototype of a Korean R-27 copy to be test-flown in 2016, and that unsuccessfully. The Hwasong-10, also called the Musudan, or BM-25 by US intelligence, was not a mere R-27 copy, but a re-engineered missile for more demanding road mobile use, enlarged to improve performance. Unlike the R-27, which was an ampule liquid propellant missile with permanently loaded fuel, the Hwasong-10 was to be fueled before it went on alert for launch. One propellant component, the oxidizer N204, was temperature sensitive and unsuitable for temperatures above 21 degrees Celsius, limiting the missile's prolonged deployment during warm days. Another R-27 innovation, the electrochemically milled tank wall structures made of a high-end aluminum magnesium alloy was also abandoned due to production complexity and costs. The Hwasong-10's airframe likely incorporated improvements from various Scud variants developed by People's Republic of Korea, leading to a larger size because the original Soviet airframe's high performance could not be matched, necessitating lengthening for more fuel. Although the Korean design team was ahead of the Iranian one, particularly in the R-27's advanced motor, it was Iran which provided the first direct public proof of R-27 propulsion technology use. A suborbital demonstrator of the Iranian Safar Space Launch Vehicle showed the use of the R-27's Venier engines and Venier turbopump in 2008. The Koreans' promising efforts, especially with the complex staged combustion cycle engine, submerged into the tank, led them to develop the Hwasong-13 intercontinental ballistic missile using two R-27 engines. However, this ambitious project was initiated even without flight tests of the Hwasong-10 for political reasons, which ultimately proved too risky. From 2016 onwards, the People's Republic of Korea conducted a test campaign of the Hwasong-10 with several launches, all unsuccessful. The extensive redesigns meant they faced a completely new missile with complex issues, leading to the R-27 design's total abandonment by them. The People's Republic of Korea reverted to a simpler Soviet engine design with a simpler gas generator cycle, which was known to them from the Scud, avoiding exotic features like a main engine submerged into the tank. The Korean decision to abandon the R-27-based ballistic missile designs Hwasong-10 and Hwasong-13 did not influence Iran's determination to create the Koromshar. 
while the Koreans opted for a simpler design with the high thrust potential to enable longer-range ballistic missiles, the RD-250. Iran found the R-27's medium to intermediate range applications, ideal for its needs. The challenge lay in whether Iran could master this complex high-risk technology successfully. For Iran's liquid propellant design team, the Scud design had reached its developmental dead-end after the Imad. While the Korean expertise in reverse engineering mechanical systems, particularly engines, was notable, Iran's strengths lay in other details, and systems like the guidance. For instance, the unsuccessful Hwasong-10 design used grid fins at its aft for stabilization, whereas the R-27 and Koram Shar utilized only their veneer engines for stabilization. By 2010, Iran had already developed a guidance system for the Qiam ballistic missile to support the dynamic stabilization function. It is believed that the team behind the Imad transitioned to work on the Koramshar directly from the early 2010s onwards. Although there was certainly cooperation with the Koreans on subsystems, the Hwasong-10 and Koramshar are fundamentally different designs with different approaches to the R-27 technology. The Korean goal with the Hwasong-10 was maximum range for a nuclear warhead, while Iran prioritized the highest possible payload within the 2,000-kilometer political range cap. For Iran, mastering the R-27, the world's highest performing liquid propellant missile in its range class, was the ultimate goal. The payload of the Koram Shar increased threefold compared to the Ghadar F and Ahmad, while the missile's weight only increased by 20%, while its length even decreased by about 3 meters. These features allowed it to be used by the existing underground missile base infrastructure created for the earlier missiles. The magnitude of this improvement highlights the R-27 design's superiority over the R-17 Scud. This performance leap was a motivation for Iran to develop the new platform with its significant growth potential for future variants. A key redesign aspect of transforming the R-27 into the Koram Shar was switching a high-end missile, originally designed for a nuclear role, into a cost-effective weapon for conventional payload use. This required a suitably high-performing but robust and low-cost airframe. Mastering quick-response thrust vectoring via actuator-steered veneer motors and a secondary turbopump were complexities the previous R-17 Scud design did not face. Additionally, the development required mastering the R-27's difficult technical features, such as its venting of hot gases from the engine's preburner to the tanks. This delicate feature was performed to pressurize the tanks during flight in order to avoid turbopump cavitation as tank pressures drop. Sophisticated details like this were challenges Iran had not previously encountered with the Scud design, which carried separate, relative heavy, pressurized air bottles to solve the issue. The design changes necessary to make the Koram Shar work meant that while the R-27's booster stage was 6.3 meters in length, which grew to 9 meters in the Hwasong-10, ultimately reached 9.8 meters in the Koram Shar. Thus, these were clearly three entirely different designs. The first test of the Koram Shar in early 2017 apparently suffered a late-stage veneer malfunction, but demonstrated that the basic design was feasible. The Koram Shar 1 used in the test campaign is not believed to have entered volume production. The first variant to enter initial production was the Koram Shar 2, first seen in 2019. The Koram Shar 2 was designed for two main payload options, a 1.8-ton heavy submunition warhead with the highest destructive power in Iran's missile arsenal, and a maneuverable re-entry vehicle, Marvi, similar to the one used on the Imad, but with a 1.5-ton unitary warhead. Small, lightweight rear stabilization fins were added to the Koram Shar 2 to address instability issues caused by vortices from the Marvi's fins, which would otherwise require more intensive corrective actions by the veneer engines, stressing their actuators and decreasing missile efficiency. A third warhead option for the Koram Shar 2 initial production variant was an unguided re-entry vehicle with a high ballistic coefficient. This variant, shown in 2019, aimed for a high-velocity warhead to travel through atmospheric re-entry at high speed, impacting at around Mach 8, which was higher than what's possible for the higher drag Marvi payload. This high velocity was intended to defeat endo-atmospheric ballistic missile defenses designed to intercept lower velocity objects. The relatively steep re-entry angles of around 40 degrees at high speed meant the unguided re-entry vehicle's accuracy would be sufficient estimated at around 50 meters circular error probability, considering its destructive 1.8-ton warhead. 
while this missile defense defeating mechanism would rely on inflatable decoys to counter exo-atmospheric interceptors, it would later be refined into the Koromshar 4K bar variant of the platform. It is unknown if the unguided high ballistic coefficient warhead was ever operationally deployed, and it's suspected that this project was called Koromshar 3. The guidance system of the Koromshar 2, combined with the precision of its thrust termination, significantly improves the concept of exo-atmospheric submunition release, reducing dispersion effects. While a Goddard missile typically delivers around 1050 kg submunitions equipped with heat shields for re-entry, the Koromshar 2, with its submunition warhead, can deliver 30 such submunitions. This results in 30 impacts of 50 kg warheads within an estimated 500 to 1000 meter diameter, increasing the likelihood of destruction of non-hardened targets. A lighter exo-atmospheric released submunition type reportedly also exists, increasing the number to 80 submunitions. This makes the Koromshar 2 a highly destructive asset for the IRGC Aerospace Forces, even with a single launch and is essentially immune to ballistic missile defenses such as Israel's Aero family. Therefore, the conic-shaped shroud, blunt-nosed submunition warhead, is the primary payload option for the Koromshar missile. The dispersion during re-entry, which reduced the destructive effects of such warheads when a single Goddard was launched, is mitigated by the Koromshar's three times heavier payload. Whether exo-atmospheric release is chosen for the strike, depends on the presence of missile defenses, if they are not existing or already degraded. Lower dispersion can be achieved by release of various submunition types inside the atmosphere. The Koromshar 2 is believed to be the current main production variant of the family and represents a high-end asset in the IRGC Aerospace Force's liquid propellant missile division. In the soon-released second part of the Koromshar family video series, we will take a look at the next-generation Koromshar 4 version and the future variants anticipated. So that's all for today. If you liked it, give a thumbs up, comment, and subscribe. It really makes a difference in the YouTube algorithm and is a great support to the channel. The real enthusiast can become members and given access to exciting membership area material. Thanks for your support and motivation. See you next time.